Hello everyone. Uh, today I would like to talk about how by using uh, <coughs> sorry, soil as a source of data, source of information, we can identify areas which uh, had been used as gardening areas or agricultural land in uh, medieval or modern era towns. And this is all based on research that we did in Wrocław uh, together with Cezary Kabawa, who was responsible for the bulk analysis. So bulk analysis, Agata Sabi, who did the botanical analysis, Radek Minsky, who did the uh, archival queries, maps, and written sources, and Jacek Wojciechak, who directed the excavations. This was a commercial excavation in the, in the town center. I was responsible for the, for the micromorphology here. Um, so, when we look at old plans of, of European cities, this is the example of Wrocław, but I expect that the situation uh, is similar, could be similar in, in other European cities. Uh, on, in Barbara's presentation, we saw a similar picture, for example. So we, we see the city itself in the center, often surrounded by fortifications, <coughs> and around it there's a semi-rural area, the hinterland, um, the suburb, right? which has a completely different character. Uh, we can see field plots, we can see gardens, we can see orchards. And these things are also mentioned in written sources. But then, when the city develops, uh, the character of these, of these areas it slowly changes. This is 100 years later, so there is no sign of the fortifications anymore. But we see the railway coming here, we can see well, the prison being built, and we can see some houses being built. And these are multi-story houses with cellars also. Um, the early 20th century, well, a completely different picture. So we can see a dense uh, network of, of roads, of buildings, also multi-story buildings with cellars. So there is a complete transformation of the landscape here. And uh, uh, the old land use, sometimes is preserved, for example, in, the, in street names. We have uh, the German Gartenstrasse here, for example. And so, but of course, the history of these places is also preserved in, in urban stratigraphy. As, as we saw pictures that can go meters deep, really, if it's, of course, well-preserved. And uh, a special place in these urban profiles is reserved for dark earth, and this is also in relation to, to the question of identifying gardens or areas that were used for agriculture. Uh, we heard about this already. We heard the definition of dark earth, more or less. I would just I like to add one terminological issue here, because in the literature, three terms are used for describing these, these types of sediments, the uh, horizons. So in, in Western Europe, in, as we perceive it together with Northern and Southern Europe, the term dark earth has gained acceptance and, and popularity in calling these things. But in the Eastern in part of Europe, the term cultural layer is, is much more popular. But uh, generally, we're describing the same thing. And it's important to remember, as, as Yannick mentioned, that these First two terms are, are, are descriptive terms. They, they don't imply a one formation history. They don't imply a uniform set of properties. Whereas uh, soil scientists who also study similar profiles use the term anthrosols. And this is based on, on the recognition of, of certain properties. Certain properties have to be present in the soil to call it an anthrosol. So there's some terminological confusion here. But we often describe the same things. But what has to be remembered is that, well, these formation histories can, can often be very different. So, uh, we identified this homogeneous, thick, uh, seemingly homogeneous, thick humid ridge deposit on the rescue excavations, which were conducted here. So, we are within the old suburb area in Wrocław. Uh, we were able to study five profiles in the, in the excavation. So this is the situation macroscopically. This is what we encountered in the field. So the horizon is very well visible. Uh, it's buried, it's sealed by late 19th century layers comprised of rubble, slag, all kinds of anthropogenic uh, materials. This space was used as a, as a trading place, as a parking space in the early 20th century. So this is all sealed. And the buried horizon is clearly visible here. It's locally differentiated into two or three sub-horizons. This is also visible macroscopically. Um, up to 60 centimeters thick, uh, very poor in artifacts. I, I mean, literally, we found like 50 pottery shards during the excavations, and it's like uh, six airs of, of, of land there. So it's, 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 really, it's, really, uh, it's, it's really poor. And also, in some places, these were very much visible. We interpret these macroscopically and interpreted these as signs of possible digging. 
Okay, so we wanted to know how this formed. What's it doing there, basically? So we considered three main hypotheses, three main factors which might have contributed to the formation of this. So the first one, natural pedogenesis in alluvial material. We're very close to the river there, to a confluence of two rivers, actually. The second factor, pedogenesis in materials accumulated as a result of ancient occupation, something that has been noted as, a, as an important factor for the formation of dark earth in many European cities. The third one, past agricultural horticultural activities. And we use the methodology which is as follows. So bulk analysis, micromorphology, and botanical analysis. Unfortunately, just two micromorphological samples, well, financial constraints, obviously. And this was all uh, preceded by a detailed survey in archives and on, on old maps, just to see, uh, see the picture also from that perspective. Okay, so uh, in terms of <clears throat> soil bulk analysis, the texture of these, of this buried soil, it's, it's, it's loamy sand or sandy loam, pH is neutral to alkaline, uh, the density is highest in this AP3 horizon, Organic carbon is elevated in the buried soil, and it's also quite rich in, in, in bases. When you look at it, the micromorphological picture, but as I said, just two slides, unfortunately, uh, showed good signs of mixing, so faunal activity, that the, the microstructure was channel. Uh, the APB, the, the middle layer, the middle sub-horizon, was visibly more porous than the lower one, which corresponds with the, with the higher density of the lowermost sub-horizon. Uh, the material was very poorly sorted, unsorted in places. Uh, the lowermost blackish in places horizon, the APB3, you can see this, this results from, from uh, manganese staining, uh, iron staining. Uh, this is probably the result because the terrain drips in, in one of these places, uh, kind of like creating a small depression. So perhaps this is responsible for this. Uh, for uh, anaerobic and aerobic conditions for the alternation of these conditions. Uh, what was also very visible is um, there were more organic remains in the APB2, so the middle sub-horizon. Uh, and well, what was apparent was the scarcity of anthropogenic inclusions. Some charcoal, not really much. Uh, some bone fragments, very tiny ones. And um, some dusty and silt coatings in the lowermost horizon, especially, bone like that. Uh, the botanical picture. Well, the majority of plant macro remains were, were located in the uppermost two surprises, APB1 and APB2, the upper ones, which corresponds, of course, with the micromorphology there. And the charcoal, the charcoal came from forest species, trees like, uh, it was oak, elm, uh, beech and pine, and especially beech and pine are uncommon in such settings. Uh, we're talking about the alluvial settings there. Uh, singles, chart zero grains, I mean really singles, so just one or two or three, I guess. Uh, some seeds of elderberry and raspberry also were identified, and the rest of these macro remains were, were just unburnt uh, diaspores of, of weeds which occur in anthropogenic habitats. So, uh, uh, when we combine all these results and try to come up with a history of formation of this horizon, when we look at the first hypothesis, the natural pedogenesis in alluvial material, well, we decided to reject this because the thickness is unusual for, for other known soils in, in, in such settings because other profiles were obviously studied in the city and in its, uh, uh, in its surroundings. There's also no sign of freshwater input in the, in the thin sections. Second hypothesis, pedogenesis materials accumulated in result of past occupation. Well, we don't have these materials. It's, it's not the case. We, we read some papers describing darker formation uh, as a result of such processes. Well, these thin sections which are described are full of anthropogenic stuff. We didn't have that. It's, it's, just, it's just a very different picture. So we, we speak in favor of this third hypothesis that the formation of this horizon is related to some horticultural, agricultural activities which happened there in the suburbs. But the question is, what kind of a garden soil are we dealing with? What, what, what process led to the formation of it? So uh, we would suggest that uh, triple and okay, thank you. That triple and double digging was used to, to create this soil. And what is this about? What is triple, triple and double digging? Well, 
Um, it's a certain agricultural technique that allows us to enhance the thickness of the A horizon. It's, it's often used by gardeners. Well, to be honest, the only depiction that we found of this, of this technique comes from, a, I think, a Dutch gardeners association. So, so this is taken. And it's, it's still in use, this technique. So it's still, it's still something that happens. We basically dig the soil in, in three spits in the triple digging, of course. So you remove the first 20 centimeters, put it aside, remove the second 20 centimeters, put it aside, you mix the following 20 centimeters. You need the subsoil and add some of the humic topsoil in it. You can add some manure also there. And then you replace. So you, you, you put the first spit in the place of the second one and the second one in the place of the first one. And if you apply this several times, if you apply triple digging once in a while, if you apply double digging, just mixing of the two uppermost horizons more often, in result, you get an increased thickness of the A horizon, and you have, you have these sub-horizons which show different properties, obviously. So um, what we would also suggest for Comune Parisque is probably a science of addition of, of certain manures. We would suggest ash based on the presence of these charcoals of forest species, for example, enhanced phosphorus there, and uh, enhanced uh, rich, rich, rich faces. So, that might be a sign of manuring because we haven't identified any other signs in, in section, for example, of, of adding of any kinds of other manures. Um, what has to be noted, this is very intensive. This is a very intensive agricultural technique. It's, it, it takes time for this to form. Uh, so it was not just an ordinary field, probably had to produce something that could sell well or the workforce perhaps was very cheap, just, just perhaps that was the case. We suggest that it was used for vegetable growing as a vegetable garden. And um, uh, such soils, just to conclude, because this is the end, such soils might be very common in suburban areas of, of, of medieval towns, of modern era times, uh, of modern era uh, cities. Because, well, gardens were there. We know that from written sources. We know that from, uh, from depictions. So, but we might find these more often. Um, of course, if the stratigraphy is, is preserved, because that's the that's the basic uh, requirement. Basically. Okay. So, thank you for your attention.